እንደምን አደረጃችሁ እንኳን ደና መታችሁ ዛሬ በዚህ ሰዓት በዚህ ቦታ እግዚአብሔር ሰለስ በስበን እኔ በጣም ደስ ብሏኛ ቦነ በጣም በጣም ደስ አለኝ እኔ አልበርት ባላለው እነ ዛሬ ከቤት ሰበይ አንዳንድ ጓደኞች ጋር እኔ መጣ ሚስ ዳርሊንግ አንድ ሚስት ብቻ አለኝ እሷ ድንስ ተባላለች አለች አራት ልጆች አለኝ አንድኛ ሊያ ሴት ልጅ ሊያ ተባላለች አለች ከ ከትንሽ ጊዜ በኋላ እርሷ ተነጋገራለች ሁለተኛ ሴት ልጅ ናት እሚ ተባላለች ግን ዛሬ ያለችም በሰራ ላይ ናት ግን ምናልበት ወደፊት ለሌላ ጊዜ ተመታለች ተስፋ አለ ሶስተኛ ሴት ልጅ አድሪያ ተባላለች እርሷ ተማሪ ናት ትምህርት ቤቱ በሽካጎ ነው ሙዲ ባይብል ኢንስቲትዩት ይባላል ትምህርት በዛ ተመራለች ስለዚህ ዛሬ ያለችም አራተኛ የመቻርሻ ዊንድ ልጅ ሌይትን ይባላል እርሱ ባለ ዛሬ ከሃያ አምስት አመት በፊት እኔ እና ባለቤት ከአሜሪካ ወደ ኢትዮጵያ ሄደና በዛ ጊዜ አስተማሪ ነበርኩ ተማሪዎች እኔ ተማሪዎች አሉ ዛሬ አንድ እሺ ለሰባት አመት በአዲስ አበባ እንነን ነበር ከሰባት አመት በኋላ ከኢትዮጵያ ወደ አሜሪካ መልሰናል ኢትዮጵያን ለቅን ስንመታ ግማሽ ለቤ እዚያ ቀረ በግማሽ ጊዜ በግማሽ ለቤ እዚ እንወራለው ገንዛሪ በዚ ሰዓት በዚ ቦታ ከእናንተ ጋር ለበ አንተ ነው እግዚአብሔር መስከን እግዚአብሔር ባርካችሁ ስንመለስ ረጅም ጊዜ በፊት ነበር ማለት አስር አስር ስምንት አመት እንደዛ ነው ወረድም ጊዜ ከዛ ምክንያት አሁን ብዙ አመረኛ ተፋብኝ ወይ ቴድባል ነው ያሎከም ግን ዝምብሎ ከነ ወጥዋል ከዛ ምክንያት ካሁን ጅምሮ በእንግሊዘኛ እንጋገራሉ ኢሻላ አሻለም ኤርመያስ ኢሻላ ኢሻላ So a few weeks ago Pastor Indishao and Pastor Ermeus called me and Indishao said I'm going to be traveling to Ethiopia and there are a few Sundays that are open and this was his invitation which one of those Sundays will you be joining us to speak and so that was his invitation and I will tell you it is my honor to be here like truly it's uh, it is my joy Um, today I would like to extend an invitation to you and that invitation is simply that together uh, we embrace hope and so the title for today's message is embracing hope in Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 we read that a hope deferred makes the heart sick 
but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And I believe this to be true to the human condition, to the human experience. We all have hopes. We all have dreams, expectations, plans, the way that we see our life going, and we live towards those hopes. A hope that is deferred makes the heart sick. When what you want, what you long for, what you expect, you live at a distance from that, the author says there's a human experience that he calls a sickness of the heart. Your heart aches, your heart breaks. When you experience your hopes, when your hopes come to fulfillment, the author says it's like there's a tree, a tree of, li of life, Yehud Zafanat, that's planted in your experience. And I believe this to be true of the human experience. And I know it to be true of my experience. This coming year, my wife and I will celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary. And you need to be applauding for her because she's been married to me for 35 years, so. I feel much too young to have been married 35 years, but here we are. Um, but when we were young, back when we were first married, when we were just a couple, we had hopes. We had dreams, we had expectations, we had the life that we saw ourselves living. And central to our hope was having children, was raising a family. And I still remember coming home from work one day and my wife had left a small box on my desk and I opened up the box and inside the box was just a tiny pair of baby booties baby shoes. And this was her way of telling me that the hope that we had was living inside of her. In fact, in English, we even use this language, don't we? When someone is with child, we say that they are expecting. They're living in hope. They have an expectation. They have a desire. They have a longing. And this was our experience. It was about four months after that announcement that I was at work. And just, to, get, just to, to put this in perspective, okay, how long ago this was, this was before cell phones, okay? Yes, there was a day when we did not have cell phones. How many of you remember the days where you had a pager, okay? But only the important people had the pager right? And a number would come up, and then you'd have to go find a, a, a landline somewhere to make, to make your call. Well, I had what was called a baby pager that I wore on my belt so that if anything came up, the number would come up and I would call. And on this particular day, the number comes up. And so I call. And I was informed that there had been complications and I needed to come to the hospital. And so I drove to the hospital, and when I arrived at the hospital, what I was informed was that the hope that my wife had been carrying was no longer living. So my wife went through what I imagine to be one of the most difficult of all human experiences. She actually gave birth to a hope, to a child that was not living. That will make your heart sick. A hope deferred makes the heart sick. It was about two years after that, that again, our hopes were renewed and my wife conceived another child. Hope renewed. But in like fashion, after a few months, that child, too, was lost. Now, if you have been through this, or if you know someone who has been through this, there are no words. 
There's nothing that you can say. There's nothing that makes it right. Just an aching of the heart. A hope deferred makes the heart sick. For 10 years, a period of 10 years, my wife and I lived with that hope unfulfilled, longing but not experiencing. And let me tell you that not everything in life was like miserable. We had a wonderful life. It was during that time that I was studying uh, to prepare to go into ministry. We had the opportunity to help start a church and there were good things that were happening. In fact, it was during that time that God led us for the first time to Ethiopia. So after we had been married 10 years, we left the United States and we arrived in Ethiopia. But we took with us to Ethiopia a hope that was deferred, a longing unfulfilled. When we arrived in Ethiopia, we were a couple. We were parents, in a sense, with no children. And as we looked around, what we realized that there were many children who did not have parents, for whatever reason. And we began to wonder and question and discuss and pray, might this be the way that God would fulfill our hope? I still remember the day in June of 1995 we had asked the Ethiopian government for permission to adopt two Ethiopian children. And graciously, they allowed us permission to adopt two children. And in June of 1995, my wife and I drove through Addis Ababa and we went to Bole International Airport. I'll never forget the day. And there, a friend of ours who was working in Harar, deboarded the plane, and in her hands, she had this precious little girl, and she met us outside the airport, and she placed into our hands and into our care a tree of life. It was about almost exactly one year later that we received another call and our same friend introduced us to a second tree of life. And so we had two beautiful Ethiopian children, trees of life. Now let me just pause here and try to be clear That was not a compromise. That was not second best. That was not God's plan B. Those two girls do not share my flesh and blood. They do not share my DNA, but they are my daughters. There is something that I share with them that I can't explain. I don't really have words for it. But it is as true and as real as anything that I know. And that's the way that God took a hope deferred and planted two trees of life. Now, as you know now, that's not the end of the story. I still remember going home from work and my wife meeting me and she says, you're not going to believe this, but I think that I'm pregnant. Now, based upon our former experience, that was not all that hopeful because she had been pregnant before. But in this case, for whatever reason, she was able to carry this child to term the majority of the time in Ethiopia. 
We returned to the United States and my wife gave birth to our third tree of life. And then because, pardon me, because God has a great sense of humor, about five years later, thank you, brother. About five years later, again, I walked home to see that look on my wife's face. <laughs> and again, she was pregnant. Now, I had Ethiopians years ago tell me, you will have more children, and you will have a son. But I don't know what they based that on. I don't know. Maybe they were prophets. I... But we welcomed our fourth tree of life, my son Leighton, into our home and into our life. A hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And this is my story. This is our experience. Sometimes I still have to step back from it. It almost seems surreal. It's amazing to me the way that God has worked, what he has done in our lives. And today, I want you to embrace hope. But let me be clear. The hope that I offer today, the hope that I invite you to, it is not my story. It's not my experience. I'm very, very blessed that God has done for us what he has done. But I don't stand before you today and invite you into the hope of my story. That's just what God did for us. In fact, I can't do that. It would be dishonest for me to do that because I'm not going to stand up here and tell this like it's a fairy tale and everyone lives happily ever after, right? We know better, don't we? We live in a world that is filled with disappointment, that's filled with questions, that's filled with unfulfilled hopes. And for me to stand up here and just say, look at this, you know better. Even within our story, as beautiful as it is, there are many questions, there is much pain, there is much that is unresolved. I cannot imagine what it's like, and certainly our girls have had opportunity, they have had blessing, but I don't know what it's like to grow up with the questions that they have. And so for me to stand up here and say, well, what a wonderful, yes, it is a wonderful thing, but that's only part of the story. And that is not the hope that I offer to you. The other thing that I will say, just being honest, is that that's just the story of my family. If you look at the whole story of my life, there are many things, there are many hopes, there are many longings, there are many desires that are unfulfilled that I don't know how the pieces fit together. I can't, I can't present it in a story form that says, look at how all this goes together. I don't know. And that's just being honest. And the last thing is this. I will not stand before you today and offer to you some kind of formula. Hope is never a matter of math. You can't calculate it. A plus B does not always equal C. And I don't have principles that I can give to you and say, well, if you're in a place where you're longing for something, you're hoping for something, you're living at a distance for something, just do A, B, and C, and then this is what you'll experience. I don't have a formula like that. All I have is the experience of my life, and that is what God has done for me. However, I do invite you to hope. And the hope that I invite you to, it's not mine. And so maybe it's just best to allow the one who offers this hope to speak for himself. This is the hope that I would invite us to embrace today. In Isaiah chapter 61, 
verses one through three. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And this is what I want you to hear. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. This is my hope. There is a sovereign Lord. There is a sovereign Lord. He is well acquainted with our hopes, those fulfilled and those unfulfilled. He sees our mourning. He sees our grieving. He sees our darkness. He sees our pain. He sees our brokenness. It is not lost on him. He is completely aware and he cares. He cares enough to step towards us. He cares enough to meet us right in the middle of our unfulfilled hopes and all of our question and all of our pain and all the things in our life that just don't fit. In fact, he loved us so much that he actually stepped into our world. And if you read about the ministry of Jesus, the very beginning, the very outset, we're told that he goes into the desert and he wrestles, right? He's tempted and he engages the enemy of his soul and of our souls. And coming out of that, he goes to his hometown and he shows up in Nazareth and he goes up to the front and they give him a scroll. You know what scroll it is, don't you? It's the scroll of Isaiah. That he doesn't just turn anywhere, he turns to Isaiah chapter 61 and he opens it because there is a sovereign Lord. And this Lord meets us in the middle of our brokenness. And Jesus recites, quotes, Isaiah 61, and then he says this. He says, today, this prophecy, these words, these are fulfilled in your hearing. It's why I'm here. It's why I've come. I'm aware of where you're at. And I'm here to heal. I'm here to meet you. There is a sovereign Lord, and he is aware, and he does care, and he's present in Jesus. And my friends, that is hope. So this last summer, I had the opportunity to return to Ethiopia. Had not been there in 18 years. It was wonderful. Uh, like it was wonderful. I went at the invitation of my daughter. And we were there to embrace hope. And so I'd like to invite my daughter, Leah, to come up. And I want for her to be able to extend her invitation <laughs> of hope to you. So. This is my daughter, yes. but she is also your daughter. Thank you. Most importantly, she is his daughter. 
I'll check my tissue. Is there another issue? Similia Ibalal, but how many kerta? Amarinya Alchalem. I have just now exhausted all <laughs> of the Amarinya that I know. So thank you. <laughs> But I will tell you this, I have become a student of our beautiful language, and I hope that this is just the first of many times that we are together, and that each time I will slowly improve. Um, before I say anything else, I want to uh, welcome, especially all of my friends who are here this morning. These people who are sitting in these first couple of rows are people that have poured into my life. They have been Jesus's living and walking hope to me, and they are partnered in um, this next chapter of life for me. All right. So my dad has just shared with you some of his own story of this hope that is deferred. It's one of he and my mom's desire to have children, their heartbreak and their disappointment, and the way that the Lord has brought our family together. However, my journey into that experience is when I was five weeks old on July 15th of 1995, that moment that my dad described when I was handed to them and became a part of their lives, the longing fulfilled. But my life begins five weeks before that, five weeks separated from this family. Those are weeks that are a mystery to me in many ways. I have no idea what would have affected either my life or the life of my family in that time. Poverty, disease, abuse, death, things that many of you in this room have been affected by as well. Some combination of all of these things, however, led to my abandonment as a newborn baby on the streets of Harar. I think we can all agree that this is not where a child belongs. But this is the reality of over five million children in Ethiopia. That is over 5% of the population of the entire country living as orphans. These are children living on the streets or being forced into overcrowded and corrupt orphanages. Again, this is not where a child belongs. In this past year and a half, God has completely redirected my life to return to Ethiopia. I had been in Africa a number of times. I had visited beautiful places, spent extended time in Zambia and Uganda. And I each time would come back saying, Lord, send me, but not to Ethiopia. Do not send me there. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Do not send me to Ethiopia. It's hard. Amarinya Alchelem. I'm in big trouble if you send me there. How can I communicate? How could I be an effective tool for your ministry? I'm scared, God. It hurts, God. This is a place that represents pain, God, but I had no idea the way in which God would redeem my story through allowing me, through calling me home. When I return to Ethiopia, I will be serving with a ministry called Hope for the Fatherless. It's a ministry that was begun by a man who is a friend to this church, Balai Gebru. His own journey as one of these five million children led him to begin this ministry to the orphaned and vulnerable children of Ethiopia. 
over this summer, my dad and I were spending some time with them, and it was actually our very first day in Ethiopia that uh, Belai picks us up from the airport. We go and drop our bags off, and he says, okay, we're going to the government orphanage today. Uh, we went to visit, we drove across Addis and went to visit the orphanage where many of our children have come from. And we walked in and you know going in, this is not a good place. But I had no idea. I had no idea the heartbreak of seeing two, three, four children crammed in a crib just screaming for someone who was never coming. And we walked through the rooms with, it was the three of us and there were some visitors as well with us and we walked through the rooms and I felt frozen. I was so overwhelmed by the feelings of being in this place of darkness that I ended up having to walk out. I stood in the hallway and I waited. I couldn't engage in what I was seeing. Everyone came out a short while later and we headed to the car and as we were walking, I noticed that Belai was wearing our, our ministry shirt and it says, hope for the fatherless, repair the despair of orphaned and vulnerable children. I felt as if I had been hit by lightning I kept repeating that word again and again and again in my head. Tesla, hope. Hope, hope, hope. As we got in the car and we began to process everything, I kept repeating this word, hope. How on earth could there be hope in the face of such a heartbreaking problem? Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6, I apologize for not having a slide, but it reads, Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. In other translations, it says God settles the lonely in families. We, followers of Jesus, are the settled and adopted children of God. We can live in hope because of that. I think we can all agree that this is a very exciting time to be an Ethiopian. Politically, socially, economically, this is an amazing time in the life of our country. As you walk through the streets, you can feel the excitement in the air. And if you ask people, they will say, I have hope, I have hope, I have hope. There is peace, there is beauty that is coming to our country and we have hope, but for us, us, as the adopted and settled children of God, our hope for change in our own lives and in our homeland is not rooted in patriotism. It's not rooted in the promises of any man. It is rooted in our identity as adopted children of God. And when we remember what God has done on our behalf to settle us, to bring us into his family, we become transformed. We become living and walking hope. And that hope is powerful. And it is powerful enough to change Ethiopia. And it is powerful enough to change the world. On January 31st, I will be stepping onto a plane headed to work full time with the Ministry of Hope for the Fatherless. The 
question that is at the center of our ministry is simply, what would happen? What could God do if believers, those who have been settled into his family, what would happen if we began to care for the fatherless? Our desire is to see the church take up this cause as a direct response to our identity as adopted children. I have some pictures that I want to share with you of the kids that we work with. Uh, these first couple of pictures, this is the very first day. These are some of our first children who came to our ministry. They are stepping out of the gates of the ministry, or sorry, of the orphanage that we had visited that one day. This was in early 2017. You'll see Uncle Ben here. Uh, these were our first children. And then if we can show the next picture. We were blessed with a second group of children from the same orphanage uh, just a few months ago in March. And that was them the same day that they were walking out of the orphanage. And then can you show the next picture? This is what they look like today, full of hope and life. And can you show the next picture? Yeah, these are our very first group of kids. If you were to meet our children today, they would tell you that uh, they have found life and they have found hope, but not because of anything that Uncle Ben has done for them, because of what Jesus has done for them. <laughs> These children are able to heal from trauma in a loving and family-like environment in which first and foremost they are hearing that they are his children. But the ultimate goal of our ministry is to see every single one of these children settled into homes. Can we show this next picture? This is Faven. Faven is four years old and she had lived in uh, the orphanage, Kububut's Eye, uh, for several months before coming to our, one of our homes. When a child enters the orphanage with no family name, they are actually given the name of the orphanage. So I, even though Faven had been in our care for over a year, she still carried with her the name of a place that represented darkness in her life. She carried that with her. She had no family name, so her name had become this orphanage. But, can we show this next picture? On August 10th of this year, we celebrated that Faven was adopted by a family in Ethiopia. She has a new name, and she has a forever family. This picture to me symbolizes hope in its purest and truest form. Faven knows who she is. And so she has actually turned completely away from us because she knows who she is and she's running towards it. But then at the last second, this is right before she got in the car to leave, she turned around and waved to her family. That is, that is how we are able to live our lives, fully turned towards the hope that Jesus offers us, but remembering what he's done behind us. And Faven is now running headlong into this hope of a new life. I want to end by reading again the passage in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, 
to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. God has written our stories, and he is in the business of redeeming them. He has come with good news of our settlement, of our adoption into his family, and a powerful promise of hope in our every situation. Hope that transforms us and allows us to take up a garment of praise that we might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Thank you. It's a special time this last summer, uh, shared together in Ethiopia. <clears throat> Towards the end of my time there, there was a conference that was being held by a church from the United States that was visiting Ethiopia, and it was a conference on hope. And they invited our children from Hope for the Fatherless to come and sing at the conference. And so as we were driving, it was one of the last days before I came back to the States. Um, we were in the car, and I said, Leah, you should sing with them. And then I left the States, and I didn't get to go to the conference. I didn't get to, to see what happened. And sometime later, I was sitting in a restaurant here in Denver, and my phone dinged, and I picked it up. And there was the video of Leah at Millennium Hall with these children on a conference about hope, singing about hope. And so we would like to share that video with you as we close today. And I'll just tell you this, that the, the video quality is not good. Like it's distorted and it's blurry. But when I looked at it, I thought, actually, that's perfect. Because it's out of the distortion. It's out of the fog. It's out of the darkness. It's out of the brokenness. It's out of the hope deferred that God steps in and brings hope.